about unity consciousness and how it relates to activism. So I've been an activist on and off since I was a teenager. Um, and I won't tell you how long that's been, but it's been a while. Most recently, um, spending time with uh, Occupy. Woo! <laughs> You've heard a lot about it tonight. Um, and I, I just want to encourage you to keep an open mind if you don't consider yourself an activist, because um, I think everything that I'm going to talk about in relates to all of us in part of our human family, whether you consider yourself an activist, a healer, or just a, a mere mortal, whatever you are. So one of the things that I've noticed in all activist circles that I have been with is um, a big sense of camaraderie and family, but also um, the opposite of that, or the shadow side of that, um, when people tend to disagree. In groups I've been involved with in the past, there's been a little less of that because it's been a very specific group, so if it's an environmental group, they're all on that page. But with Occupy, there's everybody, yeah. um, and there's every cause, and there's every, um, every different perspective all within one group. Every age group, um, every political view, um, races, ages, you named it. And so there can tend to be a tendency to get attached to what I call your cross to bear or your pet project, <laughs> whatever you came in to occupy with. So if you came in because you're environmental or you're really political or whatever your particular viewpoint is, and sometimes when everybody else doesn't take that particular viewpoint as top priority, that can be a bit of a clash. And I'm sure anybody that has been involved in has seen the clash. And so what I want to focus on um, is how can we avoid that, not just within activist groups, but within ourselves, within our own minds and hearts, and then um, within the world. And so I'm sure everybody that's you know, read anything that's kind of pseudo-spiritual has heard this phrase, we are one. What the fuck does that mean? Ah! No, really, I mean, intellectually, right, makes sense, but how do we in our day-to-day -day lives remember that we are one in every moment? So, you know, when you see people not giving their seat up to the little old lady on the bus or littering, okay, those are my triggers, maybe not yours, how do you take a moment and go, right, I am you? So I have a couple of um, guided contemplations that I would like to go through on this and um, then just a couple of ideas. I just want to have a disclaimer here though, I have by no means mastered this concept. It's just something that I try to put into focus all the time. Um, and because I focus on it a lot, I've had a bit of time to chew on it. And so, if you've never um, meditated or sat through a guided contemplation or anything before, don't worry, all you have to do is sit up tall. It helps if you close your eyes just because then you'll have more of a inner focus instead of a external focus. So I'll start with the first one, which I don't have memorized, so I'll have to read. So just take a moment to sit up tall, and close your eyes, and find your inner awareness. The part of you that knows that you're alive, that you're breathing, that you're thinking. It's that subtle but hidden witnessing part of you that is the basis for everything that you experience. Take a couple of deep breaths here and begin to become aware of the part of you that is aware. And now think of a loved one. Bring to mind someone whom you genuinely love and adore. Really try to picture this person in your mind and feel in your heart how you feel about this person. And then think to yourself, with all of our differences in personality and history, we share one consciousness. At the level of pure awareness, we are one. Or if that seems a little abstract, you could consider, like me, this person seeks happiness. This person too feels pain. The more you can identify yourself with awareness and the recognition of awareness in another person, the more you will feel kinship. Now bring to mind an acquaintance. Bring to mind someone to whom you feel neutral about. Maybe somebody you see every day but don't know that well. Someone from your local coffee shop or corner store. And again, have that same recognition that there is one consciousness in both of you. 
Like me, this person seeks happiness. This person too feels pain. And then think of an enemy. Bring to mind someone you dislike, or just someone you regard as an enemy, maybe a public figure you hold in low esteem. And remind yourself again, different as we may be, the same consciousness dwells in that person, is in me. On the level of pure awareness, we are one. And then feel that energy. Let this idea include the physical world. Allow yourself to contemplate the fact that there's a single energy that underlies everything in the universe. That on the level of subatomic particles, everything that you see and feel is part of one big energy soup. One energy flows through everything in the universe. And with that in mind, think to yourself, all that I see, all that I touch, all that I imagine is one, of, is one conscious energy. And then hold that thought. Questions will come up, and they're worth exploring. But for now, there's greater power in just simply holding the thought, all of this is one consciousness, as a mantra. And then see if you can try to see your world that way. See how the thoughts of oneness soften the edges of your judging mind and open you up. Notice if it eases the feelings of frustration, anxiety, and fear. How it tends to bring up feelings of peace. And then take it to the streets. After you've practiced this contemplation on your own a few times, try taking it out into your world. Looking at the angry driver in the lane next to you or the sad woman on the bus and remind yourself the same consciousness is in that person, is in me. Or the person on TV whose politics you disagree with and remind yourself the same consciousness is in that person, as in me. And as you add these practices to your life, you can look for different ways to recognize kinship of consciousness. Maybe recognizing the light in the eyes of an animal, the living sap in a tree. And as you do, just observe the effect that it has on you. And if you notice that you're feeling more connected, more open, then honor those feelings. And know that you are experiencing some of the qualities of an awakened state of being. I have one more guided contemplation for you, and this one's a little more freeform. And this is a meditation that's been done for many, many years in India, and some of you may be familiar with Ram Das. This was his guru's way of, of getting us to our core, to our essence. And so it starts by just asking yourself questions, so I'll, I'll guide you a little bit, of course you're all gonna have your own answers. And so it starts with, who am, who am I? Most people would come up with their name first. So who am I? And then say to yourself your name. And then ask yourself, if I was not named that name, would I not still be me? The next most obvious one for most of us is our sex, male, female. Have you been born in the opposite sex? Would you not still be you? And then we can go to our different cultural backgrounds and ask yourself again, had I been born somewhere else, would I not still be me? And you can keep going and going with this until it gets to the point that hopefully you realize that you are whatever that timeless, quiet essence, whatever you want to call it, your spirit, your soul, your whatever it is that you put, that is what you are. If we can remember this, then we will feel more connected and more open and less judgmental. Those of you who want to can open your eyes if you'd like. So this all sounds incredibly woo-woo, right? I'm a yoga teacher, so you'll have to forgive me. I get a little woo-woo at times. But I'm also incredibly practical. And so when I first started thinking about these concepts, I mean, they sound very good in theory, mentally, right? We get it intellectually, but how do we actually do that in the day-to-day -day life when you're in that moment where you're about to judge somebody and see them as separate? So I have three ideas on that, and only one of them is mine, so I'll give credit where credit's due. So what I tend to do is if I'm, you know, finding myself being critical of somebody else for being whatever it is, inconsiderate, I stop and ask myself, have I ever been inconsiderate? The other one um, comes from Ram Dass, and he says when you find yourself in those moments to remind yourself with a simple phrase, not to, meaning we are one.
And the third one comes from that crazy hippie in the back with the rainbow hat, Brent. <laughs> what would love do? And that one actually, I think, has had the biggest effect on me because immediately that gets me out of my left brain and into my heart, as soon as I say, what would love do? So the last thing I would like to do is offer a mantra. And I'll give you the English translation and then I'm just gonna do it a cappello. It won't be as beautiful as the first one with the guitar because it's just gonna be bellowed out. Um, if anyone knows it and they want to join, great, or if you just want to focus on the meaning of the words as I do it, that would be awesome too. So, loosely translated, it means, may all beings be well, may all beings be happy, may all beings be free. May my life aid in the well-being, happiness, and freedom for all. So you can either keep your eyes open or closed, whatever works for you. And if you feel like it, you can bring your hands to your heart. <laughs> translation of the word namaste, although there's very flowery descriptions you can hear, literally means I bow you, I bow you, just a way of acknowledging that what is the same in each of us. Namaste. Namaste.